Well, hello again. Um, welcome to what I think is going to be the last unit that we have for this year. Um, and of course, we have a little while left, but that's because this unit can encompass a lot of stuff. Um, I broadly titled it an energy unit, but in most textbooks, the energy unit is broken into lots and lots of different chapters. So I'm going to kind of lump it all together in this unit. Um, and I'm going to start with what's something that's pretty important, I think, and that is to recognize all the different ways that we can see energy or that we can measure energy or that we can store energy. And we call these the forms of energy. And in my class, um, we, we recently looked at all the different ways that people describe the forms of energy. And what we found is if you look up on the internet, sometimes you'll see people say there's two forms of energy. Other places you look, you can find as many as 14 forms of energy. So what I'm going to describe here, and I'm going to show you why there's, there can be this disagreement on how many different forms of energy there are. Um, but just know that it's not super important that you know that there's some magic number associated with it. It's, energy is really hard to define. It's much easier to recognize it when you have it. And most of these are going to be kind of familiar to you, um, especially the ones that we're going to start with today. Um, I'll do some of them today and I'll do the rest in the next, the next part because it's going to be kind of lengthy if I do it all at once, okay? So again, I want you to recognize these forms of energy and so that when you see a picture of something or hear a description, you can say, oh, I know that's this form of energy or that form. So it's kind of like identifying or recognizing the different forms, okay? So um, if you want to get your heading here, remember to keep these notes well because we're going to let you use notes when you're taking your quizzes and tests exams and things like that. Um, if you ever need to pause, make sure you pause it and get caught up on your writing, okay? So the first form of energy is probably the easiest one to recognize. It's not easy to describe. It's called mechanical energy. And some people list the, the mechanical energy actually as three separate forms, because that's kind of what I'm going to do. I'm going to count it as one, even though it, it shows itself in three different ways. Okay, um, so I'll describe it broadly this way. Usually related to the motion or the position, it's like where something is, of an object. Again, that's not a great definition. I want to do a little better here by showing you some of the details, all right? Um, some people just have a sense of, of what energy is. If, if you want to think of it this way, um, energy is, you'll know something has energy when it can use it to like cause a change in something. Often it's, I think of it like causing damage to something. Okay. So mechanical energy, most people recognize it based on its ability to cause damage to something. So let's start with maybe the easiest one. This is again, a subcategory of mechanical kinetic energy. All right, so this is any mass that is moving. So it's very important that you have motion. So not, it cannot be stationary. Oops. So if a car is parked in a parking lot, it doesn't have kinetic energy. But if it's driving down the street, it does. Okay, remember that important distinction. It's got to be moving. All right. Um, if we have more motion or more mass, I'll say it this way. When I say motion, I mean velocity. More mass or more velocity means more, I'll abbreviate it, KE, more kinetic energy. So if I were to maybe take this pen and throw it across the room, it would have kinetic energy while it's moving, but not a whole lot because this doesn't have a lot of mass and I also can't make it move very fast. But if I had a truck driving down the highway, it's got a lot more mass and a lot more motion, more speed, and so it's going to have more kinetic energy. 
Now, do you get the idea that a truck could do a lot more damage when it's moving than this little pen could? You know, if it were each of them were to hit you, right? That's what I mean by getting a sense of what energy is. You can kind of feel it, right? So it's all about motion. We sometimes just call kinetic energy energy of motion. Now, there's two other forms of mechanical energy I want to describe. Long name for this one, gravitational potential energy. Most students have heard of potential energy before, and kinetic for that matter. But you might not know that potential energy actually comes in two little sub forms or sub flavors, I sometimes say. Um, the one most people think of is gravitational potential energy. So this is any mass that has height all about its location or its position. Remember I said that about mechanical energy. So more mass or height means more gravitational potential energy. Hope you're okay with me just writing GPE. It's a little shorter, probably easier for you too. Okay, so let's use the example of if I put my pen down. See, my pen is just sitting on my, my tabletop here. Um, it doesn't look like it has any energy, but I'm going to show you something. That's my floor down there. So if I drop this to the floor, now it's lower. So what we would say is this pen, when it was up at this height, has more gravitational potential energy than when it's down there on the floor, okay? So the higher you go, the more gravitational potential energy. So um, again, we, we mentioned about the, the ability to cause damage to something. You know, if you like hold a bowling ball over the floor, you get the, abil the, the idea that that has the ability to cause damage, right? If you were to drop it on something, um, that's how you know something has gravitational potential energy. If you were to take a bowling ball and just have it sitting on the floor, then it really can't do much damage there, right? So a bowling ball on the floor just sitting there has neither kinetic nor potential energy. But if it's moving, now it has kinetic energy, but still doesn't have gravitational potential energy because it's, it's on the, you know, if it's moving across the floor, it doesn't have any height. Now you could have both. You could have something moving and up high. Uh, think about maybe a car that's on an overpass on the highway. It has some height above the, the ground below it, and it's also moving. So just because you have one doesn't mean you can't have the other. Okay, so that's like the second subtype of mechanical energy. And the third we call elastic potential energy. Elastic potential energy. Um, let me describe it this way. Again, you all know what this is. Um, a stretch or possibly squish of a spring or other like elastic band. I think like a rubber band. Those can have elastic potential energy. You know, an elastic cord or something. You know how I'm sure in school your teacher doesn't let you take a rubber band and stretch it out and fling it at somebody because that has the ability to do damage to their eyes, right? If it would hit them. Or even if it doesn't hit the eyes, that can still hurt. That rubber band doesn't really have the ability to cause any damage if it's not stretched out. So a rubber band by itself wouldn't have energy. But when you stretch it out, then it will. The same thing for a spring or any elastic cord of that kind, okay? So more stretch means more, I'll call this E-P-E -E for short, a little abbreviation there, elastic potential energy, okay? So there's the three types of mechanical energy. Again, they're all kind of lumped together under the the category of mechanical energy, right? 
We're going to look at two more types here before we call it good for this part. Okay, this second one, uh, wait a minute, I got something on my screen there. There we go. The second one, is again, another one that I think you're going to know, call it sound energy. Okay, so um, it's interesting, though, that humans don't hear every sound that exists. Our ears are tuned only to certain ones. So it's kind of hard to define what sound is. Does, does it mean we have to hear it? Because animals can hear some sounds that we can't. You know, dog whistles are much too high for our ears, ears to hear. Um, but we can hear some sounds that other animals can't. So it's not always about what your ear can hear. Um, so let's just describe it this way. So it's an energy that starts with a vibration. And almost anything can vibrate. You know, if you take a hammer to something, um, especially if it's metal, that whole thing will vibrate. We sometimes say it resonates. Uh, imagine hitting a bell. Um, every musical instrument begins with a vibration of something. It might be your lips if you're playing a brass instrument. It might be a wooden reed if you play a woodwind. It might be the drum head. It might be a string if you bow on a string or pluck a string playing a guitar. It might be your vocal cords if you're a vocal musician. But something has to start with a vibration. So the energy starts as a vibration and then travels through a material, it's often the air, but sound can travel through lots of things. It could travel through a solid, it can travel through water or any liquid. Some, some materials allow it to travel more easily than others. And it travels in the form of a, of a wave. So there are what we call sound waves, the way they travel, okay? Um, those are kind of difficult to describe. I'm not going to get into all the details. I thought about talking about a little bit more detail on this, but we've gone, heck, we'll be close to 15 minutes here. I think that's enough. So I just want you to know that it starts with a vibration, and then it can travel in the form of a wave. Now, some people categorize sound waves as just a special type of kinetic energy, because you do have to move some things in order for, for you to be able to hear sound. Okay, so again, it makes it difficult to really categorize how many forms of energy there are because some sort of fit into two different places. All right, and let's talk about this last one. Thermal energy. Almost impossible to see this. Kind of like you can't see sound waves either. You can hear them because your, your eardrum is tuned to a lot of the sounds that are made, um, but you can't see them. You can even sometimes feel them. But with thermal energy, usually you recognize it because something's hot. All right? But really what's happening, the reason there is thermal energy, is completely microscopic. These are microscopic vibrations of particles in any object. So all objects, everything has at least a little bit of thermal energy because even though we can't see it or feel it, every particle in every object is always moving at least a little bit. Okay, it may not be moving like the pen flying across the room, but tiny, 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 impossible to see, microscopic, invisible vibrations, okay? When all those vibrations cease completely, we say that thing has zero thermal energy. Um, and it, we have a name for that, it's called absolute zero. But um, anything that is moving a little bit um, has some thermal energy. And we recognize it by taking its temperature, okay? Um, so this is usually felt as heat. So more vibrations is more thermal energy. Got a really good picture of this. Um, kind of hard to draw, 
but I'm going to show you and then we'll come back and we'll finish up with a, just a, a rough sketch. Okay, so let me change my screen here real quick. All right, so let's talk about particles. So I'm going to draw things um, kind of like this to represent thermal energy. Um, you know, when things are solid versus liquid versus gas, I think this was part of what we did in the first, um, the first part of this year. Solids don't have much motion. They kind of stay put, but you can't see the small little vibrations that those particles have, but they do exist. And when the particles start moving more freely, they can flow across each other. They're not stuck in one spot in like a crystal form or in a solid form. They can flow. There's still some things holding them together. That's why we can't separate it completely. There's more energy there. And that energy is what we call thermal energy. And then if we keep adding thermal energy, these particles will break away from each other, fill the space in the form of, of um, matter we call a gas okay, or a vapor. So the states of matter are a good way to just demonstrate how things with more thermal energy, um, you can see more motion of the particles, even though this is a picture. Um, sometimes, though, even without changing the state of matter, we can have more thermal energy. So if we have particles that are just moving a little bit, we would consider that substance kind of cold, the temperature's low. But if we have more motion, more vibrations, um, more collisions with each other, that would be a material that's a little hotter right? Maybe not hot enough to form into a gas or a vapor, but still has more motion and more thermal energy. So the states of matter, hot and cold, those are great ways to kind of recognize um, something with thermal energy and something with more thermal energy, okay? So let's just make a little notation of this about the states of matter. So if we're going to measure thermal energy, we would say that a gas is you know, from math class, greater than more thermal energy than a liquid. And that is greater than a solid. Okay, again, just what I was showing you on that little graphic. Um, or a hot substance greater than cold substance. Hot and cold are adjectives. They're not nouns. It's not like I have some hot or I have some cold. It's just a measure of how much thermal energy an object has. Okay. And it shows up as temperature. All right. So we've been going on quite a bit here, but I wanted to get into some of the details of these so that you can, again, the goal is for you to recognize which form of energy you have when you have energy and when you don't have energy. Okay. All right. We'll get the rest of the energy forms in another one. Um, give you a chance to practice this a little bit and call it good.